Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We have three problems concerning the convergence of sequences of random variables. In the first problem, we have the sequence x1, x2, x3, and so forth. These random variables are independent and identically distributed. The values taken by random variable x1 are 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on, or minus 3, minus 5, minus 7, minus 9, and so on. The probability that x1 is equal to m times minus 1 to the m is the positive constant c divided by m squared ln m. c is chosen so that the sum of probabilities is equal to 1. The question is about the convergence to 0 in probability of this quantity. We have here the sum from x1 to xn divided by n. Here, the summand is m times minus 1 to the m times c over m squared ln m. m is from 2 to n. Note that the random variables do not have a first moment. Split the random variable x1 to the positive and negative parts. Let's compute this summation here, g from 1 to infinity, 2g. The probability that x1 is equal to 2g is c divided by 2g all squared ln 2g. This sum is equal to positive infinity. To verify this, we can use the Cauchy condensation test. If we have a sequence, a n, a non-increasing sequence of non-negative real numbers, then the sum over positive integer n of a n is greater than or equal to the sum over non-negative integer n of 2 to the n minus 1 a of 2 to the n. If we choose a n to be 1 over n ln 2 n, then the summand here is 2 to the n minus 1 times 1 over 2 to the n ln 2 times 2 to the n. What we have here is sum n from 0 to infinity, 1 over 2 ln 2 times n plus 1. This is 1 over 2 ln 2 times the harmonic series, which is infinite. We can do the same for the negative part of the random variable x1. Since these two expectations are infinite, the first moment does not exist. If we have a sequence of random variables, y1, y2, y3, and so on, we can examine the convergence of this sequence in probability to zero by examining the probability of the event that the magnitude of yn minus zero is greater than epsilon. This probability for any positive epsilon must tend to zero as n tends to infinity. If we have a non-negative sequence, beta n, in our case, the sequence is a sequence of probabilities, and if the limit as n tends to infinity of beta n is equal to zero, by definition, for every eta that is strictly positive, there exists an n of eta that is a positive integer, such that for every small n greater than or equal to big n, beta n is less than eta. This is exactly what it means to say that the limit is zero when n tends to infinity. This is what we will do here. We try to show that for any positive epsilon, this probability can be upper bounded by a positive real number that can be made arbitrarily small. If we have events A and B, the probability of A is equal to the probability of A and B plus the probability of A and B complement. We use this idea here. We write down this probability as the sum of two probabilities. In one of them, we introduce this event that the maximum of the magnitude of x1, the magnitude of x2, all the way to the magnitude of xn is greater than n. Here, we put the complement of this event. We will try to upper bound each term on its own. Let's start with this one here. The probability of A and B is upper bounded by either the probability of A or the probability of B. The probability of these two events is upper bounded by the probability that the maximum exceeds N. This probability is the probability of the union M from 1 to N, magnitude of XM greater than N. Note that if the maximum exceeds N, then there must be a small m in the set of positive integers from 1 to n such that the absolute value of xm is strictly greater than n. And if any of those terms is greater than n, then the maximum is indeed greater than n. So we have equality here. This probability can further be upper bounded using the union bound. In other words, we upper bound this probability by the sum of the probabilities. The sum here is the probability that the absolute value of xm is strictly greater than n. The random variables are identically distributed, so I can replace this absolute value by the absolute value of x1. Now the summand is no longer a function of the index m. This means that this upper bound is the probability that the absolute value of x1 is greater than n multiplied by the number of terms in the sum, which is n. The absolute value of the random variable x1 is equal to m with the probability c over m squared len m. If we want the probability that the magnitude is greater than n, then we have a sum k from n plus 1 to infinity of c over k squared ln k. This n is here. Note that k is greater than n, so ln k is greater than ln n. 
1 over ln k is upper bounded by 1 over ln n. 1 over ln n can be taken outside the sum. We can write down this 1 over k squared as 1 over k times 1 over k. This 1 over k is upper bounded by 1 over k minus 1. The product 1 over k times k minus 1 can be written as 1 over k minus 1 over k minus 1. This is a telescopic sum that is equal to 1 over n, obtained when we set k in this term equal to n plus 1. The upper bound that we have is nc divided by ln n times 1 over n, that's c over ln n. For any positive eta, we can make this term here less than eta over 2 by choosing n to be greater than e to the power 2c over eta. Now we need to upper bound this probability here. We have this event that the maximum absolute value is less than or equal to n. I rewrite the sum as m from 1 to n of xm indicator the absolute value of xm less than or equal to n. The indicator function is 1 if this event is true, which is the case here, 0 otherwise. The next step is to upper bound this joint probability by the probability of one of the events. This time, we focus on this event here. What is the expectation of one of those terms? The expectation of x1 indicator absolute x1 less than or equal to n. We just write the sum k from 2 to infinity. Then we write this function here. x1 is replaced by k. So we have minus 1 to the k times k times the indicator k less than or equal to n. We multiply this by the probability that the random variable x1 is equal to k, which is the positive constant c divided by k squared ln k. k over k squared is 1 over k. This indicator function means that if k is strictly greater than n, then the summand is equal to 0. So we can remove the indicator function and have a finite sum k from 2 to n. If we look at this sum here, it is exactly this quantity. The random variables are identically distributed. So this expectation is the same regardless of m. What we have here inside the absolute value is random variable z minus its expected value. Now we can use Chebyshev's inequality and upper bound this probability by the variance of this random variable divided by epsilon squared. So what is the variance of 1 over n summation m from 1 to n xm indicator absolute xm less than or equal to n. The variance of this constant times the sum is the square of the constant, that's 1 over n squared, times the variance of the sum. The random variables are independent. The variance of the sum is equal to the sum of variances. The random variables are identically distributed. So we just have n times the variance of x1 indicator absolute x1 less than or equal to n. This variance here is equal to 1 over n, the variance of x1 indicator absolute x1 less than or equal to n. We can upper bound the variance by the second moment. This expectation is similar to this one. The difference is that in this sum, we replace minus 1 to the k times k by the square, which is k squared. Because of the indicator, we can stop the sum at n. k squared goes away with k squared. The upper bound is c over epsilon squared, 1 over n summation k from 2 to n, 1 over ln k. We have a limit theorem that if a n converges to a as n tends to infinity, then 1 over n summation g from 1 to n a g converges to a as n tends to infinity. 1 over ln n tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. So this sum here will also tend to 0 as n tends to infinity. By choosing a sufficiently large n, we can make this probability here as small as we wish. This means that this probability tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. That's exactly the definition of convergence in probability to the degenerate random variable zero. In the second problem, the random variables in the sequence are independent, but they are not identically distributed. Specifically, random variable xn is Bernoulli 1 over n squared. This means that xn is equal to 1 with probability 1 over n squared. xn is equal to 0 with probability 1 minus 1 over n squared. From the x sequence, we construct a y sequence. yn is the product k from 1 to n of 1 plus xk. We want to investigate the almost sure convergence of the sequence yn. To prove almost sure convergence, I make use of the Cauchy criterion. Let's first note that if for every v greater than or equal to m, xv is equal to 0, 
then for any pair of positive integers, n and k, both greater than m, y n is equal to y k. So what we have is m, and for every v that is greater than or equal to m, so v is m or m plus 1 or m plus 2 or m plus 3 and so on, x v is equal to 0. The claim is that if I choose n greater than or equal to m, k greater than or equal to m, then y n is equal to y k. If every x v is equal to 0, then every 1 plus x v is equal to 1. What is the difference between y k and y n? If without loss of generality, we assume that k is strictly greater than n, then y k is equal to y n times the extra terms. The extra terms are 1 plus x j, j from n plus 1 to k. If this condition is satisfied, then all those extra terms are equal to 1 and their product is equal to 1. So y k is equal to y n. To show almost true convergence, we need to prove that the limit as m tends to infinity of the probability of the following event, union, n greater than or equal to m, k greater than or equal to m, absolute value of y n minus y k greater than epsilon, this limit must be equal to zero. Is it equal to zero in our case? If this event is true, then there is an n and k values, both greater than or equal to m, such that y n is not equal to y k. If we don't have equality here, then the complement of this event is true there must exist v greater than or equal to m such that x v is equal to 1. Because this event implies that 1, the probability of this event is an upper bound on this probability. We can further upper bound by using the union bound. The probability that x v is equal to 1 is 1 over v squared. Because the sum v from 1 to infinity 1 over v squared is finite, then if we start the sum from m, and take the limit as m tends to infinity, we get zero. The sequence yn converges almost surely. In the third problem, a sequence of random variables x1, x2, and so on is a martingale. For every positive integer n, the expectation of xn squared is less than or equal to a finite positive real number m. Does the sequence xn converge in mean square? Like in the second problem, we also apply the Cauchy criterion here. Of course, the Cauchy criterion for mean square convergence. In problem three, this means that we should investigate the limit as n tends to infinity, m tends to infinity, of the expectation of the square of xn minus xm. This limit must be zero if we have convergence in mean square. We start by studying this expectation, expand the square, we have xn squared plus xm squared minus two times the product. Let's focus now on the expectation of the product the expectation of xn times xm. I can rewrite this product as x of the maximum of m and n times x of the minimum of m and n. We can apply the law of total expectation or the law of iterated expectations. We write down this expectation as the conditional expectation of the product given the random variables from x1 to x of the minimum of m and n then we have an outer expectation with respect to these random variables. Because we are conditioning on x of the minimum of m and n, we can take this guy outside the inner expectation like this. Now the inner expectation is the conditional expectation of x of the maximum of m and n, given the random variables from x1 all the way to x of the minimum of m and n. We can use this given piece of information that the sequence xn is a martingale. The sequence is a martingale. It means that those guys have a finite first moment. In fact, they have a finite second moment. More importantly, the sequence is a martingale if the expectation of xn given xn minus 1 all the way to x1 is equal to xn minus 1. And this should be true for every n. We can start from this definition of a martingale and conclude that the expectation of xn given xn minus m all the way to x1, here m can be any positive integer from 1 to n minus 1, this expectation is equal to x of n minus m. If we apply this result here to this inner expectation, we get x of the minimum of m and n. Expectation of xn times xm is the expectation with respect to the random variables from x1 all the way to x of the minimum of m and n of x of the minimum of m and n squared. This is the expectation of the square of x of the minimum of m and n. Now let's go back to the first line. We have this expectation of the square of xn minus xm. 
this expectation is equal to this right hand side now we know that this expectation can be replaced by the expectation of the square of x of the minimum of m and n note that this summation here is equal to the expectation of the square of x of the maximum of m and n plus the expectation of the square of x of the minimum of m and n if we subtract two times this expectation we get that this expectation is expectation of the square of x of the maximum of m and n minus the expectation of the square of x of the minimum of m and n because this expectation is greater than or equal to zero regardless of m and n we have this expectation greater than or equal to that one now let's think about the following sequence expectation of the square of xn this is a bounded sequence the problem statement says that for any positive integer n this expectation is less than or equal to some finite positive number big m this sequence is bounded below by zero and bounded above by m this result here tells us that the sequence is non-decreasing in other words this is a monotonically non-decreasing sequence that is bounded above by the monotone convergence theorem of sequences the limit as n tends to infinity of this expectation exists let's say that the limit is equal to l if we take the limit of this expectation as n tends to infinity and m tends to infinity then this term tends to l this term tends to l also this term tends to l the limit is l plus l minus 2 l that's zero thereby indicating that the sequence xn indeed converges in mean square 